Well, I'm sure you have all had something like this happen to you where you have a, a tool or something around your house where you've broken it and you've lost the part and you can't get another replacement part possibly without just buying the whole thing all over again. And I had something similar happen when I was moving out of my old shop and I was filling up several moving vans with molds and whatnot. Um, I used a tool that actually had belonged to my late father-in-law, something called a third hand. And it's actually intended to like hold cabinets in place while you're working and screwing something into the wall or into the ceiling and holding it in place. And the way this tool works, it has a couple of these little plates on each end that when you tighten this thing up, it's, it pushes out or up and down or uh, whatever direction you want. And on the face of this plate, the part, the kind of the business end that goes against the wall or ceiling is a very thin rubber veneer. And then that's backed up with something that feels kind of like ABS uh, plastic here. Now, uh, it's kind of like those of you who are familiar with the freight world, you know this is kind of the civilian version of a, a load retainer for freight trucks. So they have a lot of different uses, but uh, the problem I ran into was uh, when I was moving, there was I, I had several of these, but uh, only one had both of the little end caps. And once I got settled, I thought this might be a fun little project to reproduce these little guys because I don't want to go and buy the tool just to get these parts. And the other thing was, looking at the original part, I thought there's several things about this that could be improved. So. Uh, for instance, I thought this was a little bit on the thin side, and you see this is a, I measured this with my D scale, my D gauge, and this measures at just under a 70 on the D scale. So not too bad, but it is a little bit on the thin side. And then this little grippy part here that goes up against the wall or ceiling is really like ridiculously thin. And I know a lot of that's because the lizard people like to keep everything as cheap as possible, the whole functional obsolescence thing. But me being a guy that's gonna use this thing on a regular basis, I like this to be, I'd like a little meatier grippy pad on here and maybe a little thicker uh, section of plastic there. And then one of the real important things is that plastic has to have enough give so it can snap onto that ball joint later on when it's put back onto the original part. So if the, the main part of the tool has an upper and lower little ball joint, a little plastic thing like a little uh, ball joint that just clicks in right there. So my goal here is to take this and add some thickness to it. I'm gonna use some modeling clay to add some thickness to this and remold it, and then be able to cast this as a functional part using a combination of hard plastic or hard casting resin and a, a, a face or a kind of business end of soft rubber that will grip up against that surface. Now I measured this, this is so thin. I, it was really hard to get a reading with my Shore A gauge but this reads about like a 50 shore A. So anything stiffer than that might have the risk of actually sliding around and not really compressing. And so I'm actually gonna go with about a 40 shore A on this. But uh, that's my goal is to reproduce this little guy with a little thicker section there so it's not as prone to warping. And then most importantly, a better uh, thicker plate of rubber on the bottom of it so that it grips the wall or floor or whatever a lot better than this original piece does. Now, one of the tricky things, and I've talked about this in my cure inhibition video, is one of the tricky things when we're addressing a part like this is the potential for cure inhibition with platinum silicone. Now, because this rubber, I have no idea what this rubber on this face part is made of, and it does come through on this side, even though I'm not molding that side, there's still a risk that I could get cure inhibition inside my mold. So as I mentioned in the cure inhibition video, this is the kind of uh, mold scenario where you would typically use a tin cure silicone. So I'm gonna mold this in a tin cure silicone so I don't have any worries of cure inhibition, and then make another part from this that I can clean up and refine and get it exactly the way I want it. And then I'm gonna mold it again with a platinum silicone. And that will give me a much better quality mold that will accept a much wider variety of casting materials in the long run and also hold up better over time. 
Now, the other thing I could do, which I won't do in this video because my really my only practical use for this is I only need about a half a dozen of these just to have around in case I need these little tools again. But if I wanted to make a lot of these, what I could also do is make multiple patterns and make a gang mold of these little guys so that I could pour these up four, six, eight at a time. But that's another video. So anyway, without further ado, let's get started. Now to begin, I'm going to take the original plastic part and put it on a bed of soft Protolina clay. Now Protolina is a sister product to Plastilina from Van Aken, so that's why that little block of Van Aken clay is sitting there in the shot. And this of course is a sulfur-free clay. Now I'm building this up about an inch thick with clay, and the reason I'm building it up that thick is Obviously, later on, this is going to be both resin and polyurethane rubber, but I want to make this a little thicker than it actually needs to be, just so I can play around later with different thicknesses in the casting process. Now, once I've roughed that out and smoothed out my clay and got that roughly the way I want it, I'm ready to make my silicone mold. Now, again, this is a silicone mold because I don't know for sure if that uh, rubber pad is going to cause cure inhibition. So just to be safe, I'm going to be making a 5024 10 cure silicone mold of this pattern on the clay bed. Now, overall, this is a relatively simple mold, so I'm just going to make a simple mold box using foam core board. And I'm going to move pretty fast through several of these processes. So if you're unfamiliar with a lot of the basic molding and casting techniques in this video, be sure to check the end screen because I'll link to some of my uh, previous tutorials that cover some of these processes in more detail. Now, once I've got everything ready, I'm going to release the pattern and the mold box with some ZIP 301 mold release. Real important, that is a compatible mold release for this process. It does not contain any silicone oil, which could cause your silicone to bond to the pattern. So real important to use compatible mold release. Now I'm measuring out my 5024. Now 5024, TC5024, is a 10 cure silicone. This is mixed 100A to 10B by weight. Now the 100A to 10B by weight ratio is pretty typical of most 10 cure silicones. And also 10 cure formulas like the 5024 do have a higher mixed viscosity than the platinum formula I'll be using later in the video. So real important, I'll be vacuum degassing both of these formulas, but especially important on this 5024, which I believe the mixed viscosity of this formula is around 31,000 centiboys. So you definitely wanna get that mixed well and vacuum degas before pouring your mold. Now the point of this first mold that I'm going to make is twofold. Is one is I want to pull a pattern out of this that I can pour up in resin and refine. And then second, and actually more importantly, is the potential for cure inhibition. That pattern that I'm going to be molding, that has that rubber pad on the surface and that could potentially contaminate a platinum cure silicone. So here I'm subjecting my tin cure silicone to a vacuum. And remember that 5024 does have a fairly high viscosity, so you want to make sure you vacuum degas that before you pour. And one of the things I like about the 5024 is it has a long working time, but a relatively short demold time for tin cure silicone. So this has a 30 to 40 minute working time at room temperature and a demold time of about four hours, four to six hours at room temperature. So you can easily pour a mold and use it within the same day. Now, real important detail about platinum versus tin cure silicones. Remember that tin cure silicones are condensation cure silicones. That means they cure by way of ambient moisture. So the drier the air is in your workshop, the slower they will cure. So be aware of that. If you're in a humid area, they're going to cure faster. If you're in a really dry, arid climate, they're going to cure slower. This is one of the few products where humidity is actually your friend, especially if you're wanting to work fast. Now it should go without saying, but you always wanna make sure your work surface is level, and that way you have a nice level mold to work with later on. Now this is about five hours later, I'm ready to break open my mold and start casting my pattern. Now the pattern I'm going to pour up, I'm actually going to be using the same material that I'll ultimately be using as part of my finished part. I'm going to be pouring this up in TC-808 Jet Black. And part of that is just the aesthetics of it. I want this to be a nice black part that matches the original piece. 
but uh, also the physical properties of TC-808 are excellent. This is a, uh, an impact resistant, very high strength, but really hard plastic that behaves like ABS and behaves like a really tough injection molded plastic. And then it also sands really well. So that's gonna lend itself well to the pattern stage where I'm gonna clean up this original resin part. Now, overall, for my purposes, this doesn't require a lot of cleanup, but uh, you can sand as little or as much as you want. We could uh, take this down to some really fine sandpaper and even wet sand it and get a nice glossy finish all around our part. But for my purposes here, I just wanted to clean this up, give the outside a nice refined look so it doesn't look like the original was made of clay. And this is the kind of thing where this kind of pattern work would be a lot easier with 3D printing. So hopefully in some future videos, I'll get more into that side of it. But for now, I'm gonna go old school and just sand this, clean it up and get it ready for molding. Now, since this will be a platinum silicone mold, the final mold, make sure that everything you use in your sanding and finishing process is compatible with platinum silicone. Now, obviously we could have done this with the same tin cure silicone if you want. You could always come back and just mold it again after you refine your pattern and just use more tin cure silicone. But the point of doing this in platinum silicone rather than tin cure silicone is we have more casting options available to us with a nice platinum silicone mold. Ultimately, I'll be pouring this part in stages. The first stage will be hard plastic and the second will be polyurethane rubber. So I wanna make sure that the polyurethane rubber doesn't have surface inhibition from a tin cure mold. Now here I'm pouring vacuum degassed TC5130F platinum silicone. And 5130F, as you've seen in previous videos, the nice thing about this, this is a fast setting, about a 25 Shore A platinum silicone. So we can easily pour this mold and demold it within about an hour, hour and a half at room temperature. So great silicone to have around your shop to be able to pour up quick, accurate molds and perfect for this kind of application. And then of course, because it's platinum, we don't have to worry about that interfering with the cure properties of of any of the casting materials, any of the polyurethanes that we'll be pouring into that mold. So now my mold is ready and we're gonna do our first cast. Now the first cast I did with jet black resin, this is TC808 jet black. Again, that's the same resin I used for the pattern, but real important, more than just being a hard plastic, just a general purpose casting resin, TC808 has excellent physical properties that are good for functional prototypes. So obviously I want this to look like an original part, but more importantly, I want it to actually be functional. Now I'm going to back that up with a pad of FP40. FP40, and I pigmented this with some of the 6800 series black pigment. And I poured the FP40 right after the TC808 gelled so I could get as good a bond as possible because both of these are polyurethane formulas, so they both have very good adhesive properties in their liquid state. So by pouring those together and not putting any release or waiting too long between, I get a good bond between that rubber layer and that hard plastic. Now for the final parts, I decided to mix it up a little bit and actually use just the 808 Jet Black as the base or the hard plastic part that snaps to the tool and then actually do a red rubber pad. And I mainly did that just for the aesthetics of it. I wanted it to look more like the original manufactured part and have that red and black motif. So here I've allowed that uh, 808 to cure. And this is only about 10 minutes later, I'm pouring the FP40 pigmented cherry red with the 6800 series pigment, pouring that on the back and pouring that as soon as possible is what gets me a really good bond between the resin and the flexible rubber material. Now FP40, this is a fast setting polyurethane formula. So this allows you to pour that up and demold it in a relatively short time. So I was able to make one of these parts about every hour and a half, two hours tops. So quick turnaround time, which is the whole point of the FP or fast production of the FP40. So there we have our finished part and now ready to snap that on to the tool and see how that works. You see, we got that nice flexible uh, pad and it's bonded to that jet black 808 base that will easily snap into my tool. 
So now we have our finished mold and we're ready to produce as many of these parts as we need, or we can make multiple molds, however we need to do that. But now you see the process and more importantly, the material selection process for making a functional prototype like this to be able to improve on an existing part or reproduce a missing original part that uh, you need to actually function rather than just look like the original part. Now, as always, I'll put all the material links in the video description, so be sure to check those out. And check the end screen for more learning resources. I have a lot of other videos that go more in depth on the molding and casting process, so be sure to check those out as well. And if you haven't already, be sure to like and subscribe, and of course, click the bell icon so you get notified when I post new content. And thanks for watching.